a new series throughout the season of Lent as we approach Easter, a series I think you'll find interesting and one you might even consider quite memorable. So here's a short video introduction about the series we're beginning today. In this world, you will have troubles. This is not one of the promises of Jesus that we quote as often. But Christ wanted us to be prepared, not surprised, that we would face real struggles in this life. As fallen people navigating a fallen world, we are sure to encounter sin in its many forms. A supernatural kind of evil, a brokenness apparent in society, and a corruption within each of our hearts as well. We even say things like, the devil made me do it. I'm naughty by nature. Everybody's doing it. But Christians think differently. God's word isn't just a map to heaven, but a strategy for living in a broken world. We must face the reality of sin if we're going to avoid it. We must learn to discern God's voice above the temptations of this world. We must learn the way of Jesus who overcame evil with good. This Lenten season, we want to develop biblical strategies for recognizing, resisting, and overcoming the world, the flesh, and the devil. The date was October 1, 1975. The place, Manila, the Philippines. The opponents, Joe Frazier and Muhammad Ali. It was known as the Thrilla in Manila. It's considered the greatest boxing match in the history of the world. Two heavyweights fought for the third and final time. And in this Lenten season, I'm here to make a bold claim that this great battle is nothing compared to the battle for your soul. And that every single day throughout your entire life, you will battle to be who you were supposed to be against the forces of evil that come against you. We tend to think that if I'm a Christian, that means I'm on God's side, and I'm opposed to the other side, the evil side, the dark force, and we have this kind of Star Wars view of the world, good versus evil. But that's actually not what the scriptures teach. The scriptures make this different claim. They say that on one hand, you are fearfully and wonderfully made. You are created in the image of God, that you are loved more than you will ever understand. And on the other hand, you are sinful by nature. You are corrupted in the very depths of your heart, and every one of us in every way is corrupted, and so that what we want most and need most, we don't do. So yes, you are more loved than you can imagine, and you are also more flawed and broken than you can imagine. Muhammad Ali and Joe Frazier fought in Manila, but the battle for your soul wages every day in your heart. The Bible doesn't say there's good people and that there's bad people. The Bible says there's people created in God's image who've lost their way, who've turned their back on God and turned toward themselves or toward the enemy to the evil of this world. When the Bible talks about evil, they tend to talk about three things. They talk about the flesh, the world, and the devil. That's where evil comes from. Those three categories show up again and again. And today, we're going to start this series. We're going to spend two weeks on the devil. Now, some of you are already rolling your eyes and cringing or wondering how this is going to play out. Some wisdom from C.S. Lewis. C.S. Lewis, the great writer and thinker, English novelist. C.S. Lewis, the the Chronicles of Narnia, mere Christianity. C.S. Lewis said, there's two grave dangers in talking about the devil. Either we give him way too much credit or no credit at all. Both are dangerous. Most of my career as a pastor, working in churches for over 20 years now, has been minimizing the work of the devil. When somebody would say, well, the devil made me do it, or talk about how the devil's doing something in their world, or the devil's corrupting everything, I tend to kind of just pull back and say, is that really the reason? Isn't there more to it than that? But today I want to help us have maybe a better, more appropriate view of the devil and the devil's work in the world. And if you are scoffing at this and rolling your eyes or thinking this is some kind of theological, uh, I can't say that, um, (laughs) rubbish, Consider a little bit more what the scripture says about it. 
Today where I want to take you to is a story that references the devil very clearly. It's Matthew chapter 4. If you have a Bible, this would be a great one. Because the devil is such a controversial topic, you might want to write down a couple notes and pay attention to this and figure out what the scriptures do say about this. We're going to start at the, actually the end of chapter 3 of Matthew's gospel. Matthew and Mark both record Jesus' temptation with the devil in the wilderness. And there's a bunch of insight here for us to take on. We'll start at chapter 3, verse 16. It says, As soon as Jesus was baptized... He went up out of the water. At that moment, heaven was open, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my Son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. There's our character. After 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. The tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God. Tell these stones to become bread. Jesus answered, It's written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the Son of God, he said, throw yourself down, for it's written, He will command his angels concerning you, and they will lift up their hands so that you will not strike a foot against a stone. Jesus answered him, it's also written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and all their splendor. All this I'll give to you, he said, if you just bow down and worship me. Jesus said to him, away from me, Satan, for it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left him and the angels came and attended him. Friends, this is the word of the Lord Thanks be to God. Since we don't talk a lot about the devil, again, it might be helpful to write down a couple things about this. A couple points, and one I'm not even going to make in the slides here, but it's important to say right at the beginning is that the devil, according to the scriptures, is real. That this is a real encounter that Jesus has with a real presence, a real story. It's not some Old Testament fairy tale. And so right away, the, when I say the devil, and you think about a character with horns and a tail and a pitchfork, we don't find that character in the scripture. We don't find a cartoon. We don't find a make-believe story. We find a real presence that comes face-to-face, blow-to-blow with Jesus the Christ. And so this encounter happens, and the first point is this, that God's plan in a crazy way involves temptation. Think about that for a moment. We think that God would not bring us to temptation. But the scripture says the opposite, that Jesus was not surprised, that he was not terrified. The scripture doesn't say Jesus is in the wilderness and suddenly the devil came to him and Jesus was terrified. It doesn't say that. It says that the spirit led Jesus into the wilderness, that he fasted for 40 days and 40 nights. And when he was hungry, then the devil came to him. This is really interesting for a variety of reasons. You might have noticed I started with the end of Jesus' baptism story. That's important for a bunch of theological reasons. The most important one reason is that we find all three persons of the Trinity in this one story. The voice of the Father, this is my Son whom I love, with whom I'm well pleased. The presence of the Son in the water, the opening of heaven, the Spirit of God descending on Christ, all three persons. So if your theological worldview is that God does one thing, then a different God shows up, and then a different God shows up, that's not biblical. The biblical God is three persons, one essence, all coexisting for all of eternity. That's pretty deep theology. Let's get back to the point. The point is... God the Father and God the Spirit lead God the Son into the wilderness to be tempted, to be tried, to be pushed to his physical, emotional, and spiritual limit. This is part of God's plan. Now, why does that matter to you? How many here have been tempted before? Every single one of us, right? Especially if you grew up with siblings, Okay, you were tempted to do some horrible things because you had siblings, right? Every one of us has been tempted, right? The Father and the Spirit send the Son to be tempted by the devil. It's part of God's plan. 
Because life, second point here, is a battle between two kingdoms, the kingdom of God and the kingdom of evil. And until we accept that reality, we don't even realize that we're in a fight for our lives. The devil's game plan, the devil's strategy here, is to turn the son against the father and the spirit. He's trying to divide or to destroy the trinity. And if the devil does this, he turns the world upside down, and he now has a new power. And God in the Son is limited or incapable of doing what he's been sent to earth to do. This is not a small story. This is a massive story. In fact, I think this is right up there with the story of what happens at Easter. That the beginning of Easter actually starts in the wilderness. That Jesus confronts the devil face to face. Now, I think it's a bit shocking, too, that the Spirit leads the Son to this encounter, that the Spirit and the Father put the Son in a vulnerable position. Because you know what happens in the wilderness, right? Things die in the wilderness. Desperation happens in the wilderness. We reach our limit and our capacity in the wilderness. And the voice of the devil here is really, really important. Because the voice says to him, remember, if you are the Son of God, Make these rocks into bread. Do you remember what the voice of the Father said at Jesus' baptism just a few verses before? This is my son, whom I love. So that's the last voice Jesus hears. The very next voice he hears is, if you are the son of God. If The Father really loves you. Then make these rocks into bread. If God hasn't forgotten about you, if God really loves you, the devil is saying, then why did the Father bring you to the wilderness? If the Father really loves you, then why are you so hungry? If the Father really loves you, then why didn't God send you with a knapsack of resources and some angels to supply you what you need? If God really loves you, then do this for yourself. Then forget about the Father. Do you see what the devil's up to? He's trying to get the Son to turn on the Father. He's trying to get the Son to stop believing in the Father's goodness. Point number three, temptation disguises danger with attraction. That's what it is. It would be incredibly attractive to have something to eat if you're starving, right? Right? And so the devil makes this thing look good, which is not really good. And so Jesus responds to the devil by quoting Deuteronomy chapter 8, verses 3. Man shall not live by bread alone, but every word that comes from God. That's something to say today when all of us had breakfast. But if you have not eaten for days and you say, you know what, I don't need anything to eat. I'm trusting in God's provision. That's a little bit different. On the surface, it seems like the devil's tempting Jesus to meet a physical need. It's just bread, right? You know those Snickers commercials that you see? You're not yourself when you're hungry, when you're hangry, okay? Been blessed by God to raise a few children. They're not themselves when they're hungry. You're not at your best when you're hungry. The devil intentionally meets Jesus in his vulnerability. And you might be thinking to yourself right now, when am I vulnerable in life? You all have your needs, right? Are there certain times of the day that you're more vulnerable? Are there certain places in your life where you're more vulnerable? Are there certain friends or social networks that you're a part of that make you more vulnerable? It would be wise for us to pay attention and to realize those are the spaces where I need to make sure I listen to the right voice and not the wrong voice. That's what sin is, really. Sin is a shortcut, an attempt to believe an illusion. Sin is a shortcut to get something you actually need in a wrong way, meaning a good need in a bad way. If you understand sin like that, it actually reframes your whole mentality about a bunch of other things in life. It's not wrong for you to want something that you actually need, but it might be wrong how you go and get it. Think about it like this. You need to be fed, but does that make stealing okay? How about hoarding? How about gluttony? No, those are problems. You need to be clothed, but isn't there a temptation for us to determine that our clothes and our looks determine our value? And how many of us might have closets overflowing with clothes while other people don't have enough? You have a need to be safe. Every one of us does. 
But does that mean it's okay to become safe by acting like a bully toward other people? Or to initiate violence? Or is it good to be safe by cutting yourself off from relationships and becoming a hermit? Or to avoiding the risks of emotional vulnerability and therefore avoiding community? You need to be safe, but how are you going to be safe? And you need to be loved. Everyone here needs to be loved. But that doesn't mean it's okay to manipulate somebody, to extort a friend, or to lie or twist relationships. It's not okay to abuse someone to feel loved by them, to seek gratification for yourself. If you put these two, this story that we're talking about today, the wilderness where Jesus meets the devil, it's actually a contrast to Eden. Do you remember what happened in Eden? Adam and Eve are placed in this perfect, beautiful world where all their needs are met and life is good. There's, there's shalom, there's peace, there's wholeness. And the devil comes to Eve and says, did God really say that you're not supposed to eat from this tree? What does the devil do? His first tactic is always to ask a question that makes you doubt something that's actually true. Did God really say that? No, God, you won't die if you eat this, the devil says. No, you'll be like God, the devil says. The wilderness is the opposite of Eden. In Eden, they have everything they need. In the wilderness, Jesus is starving to death. In Eden, the world is lush and safe. In the wilderness, the world is barren and Jesus is exposed. In the Eden, they are with God. And everything is there. In the wilderness, God is alone. And what God is going to do is go into the wilderness and destroy death. What God is going to do is what we lost in Eden because we ate from the tree. He's going to go to the tree and die so that we might have life. You see it. It's a cool story, isn't it? Next point. The devil has a pretty simple common strategy. Something for us to pay attention to. First, the devil's going to try to get you to doubt God. Then the devil is going to try to get you to doubt yourself. And if that doesn't work, then the devil's going to try to get you to doubt God's future for yourself. What the devil's trying to do is just get like 1% of your belief so that he can get 2%, so that he can get 10%, so he can get 20%, so he can get 50%, so he can get all of your belief. So eventually, without even realizing it, like a frog in the boiling pan, you will eventually die not realizing that you've been warming up the whole time. The final request of the devil takes him to a high place, shows him all the nations of the world, said, I'll give you all of this if you just, what was the question? If you would just bow down and worship me. And there the devil's finally exposed for what he's been trying to do the whole time. He's been trying to get the sun to worship the devil. He's been trying to get the son to turn the allegiance of his heart away from the mission of the father and toward whatever would make his life a little bit easier. The real danger of your life might be that you get what you have always wanted. Because what you want is probably actually not what you need. It actually might be really dangerous for you to get what you want. I now find myself in the middle of my life realizing that by God's grace, I didn't get the things I wanted when I was 16 years old. Do you know what I'm talking about? My life would be kind of a mess if I would gotten all those dreams fulfilled. I heard this a year ago. I keep using it. At the end of our lives, we might realize that we've climbed the ladder to achieve all that we've wanted only to realize that the ladder was put on the wrong building. And how many people experience that? At the end of their life, they look back and say, man, I wish I could have done it all over and invested my time and talent and resources and relationships and things that actually mattered. I've created a simple graph here to chart this out. Jesus encounters the devil and has three temptations. The first one is a physical temptation to, to get food. The second one is a social temptation to, to a, a, a be attracted or to a to present himself as famous to the crowd. The third one is a global temptation for power and dominance. The world would believe in him. So the first one, Jesus responds to the shortcut. And the shortcut is forget about God, serve yourself, Jesus. And Jesus' choice is to wait and trust that God's going to provide. And the second temptation to impress the crowd, to perform a circus stunt, Jesus chooses instead to be misunderstood and rejected by the crowd. 
And the third one, the global temptation to worship the devil, to take power through compromise, Jesus instead chooses to give up control and give up power again and again to allow people to freely choose their allegiance or not. Now, at first look, you could look at this and say, well, doesn't Jesus do all these things anyway? Physical needs, global needs, social needs. Eventually, Jesus feeds 5,000 people by turning a couple loaves of bread into a multitude of bread. And Jesus eventually impresses crowds of people with his miracles that they come to believe in him. And eventually Jesus does gain the authority that he is the king of kings and the Lord of lords. The question, again, remember, come back to temptation. Temptation is to do something to meet a need, a good need, in a wrong way. Jesus is here to accomplish all those things, but not in the wrong way, in the right way, in a way that's faithful. He will meet physical needs. He'll heal the sick. The deaf will hear, the lame will walk, the blind will see, the hungry will be fed. He'll impress the crowds or show them that he is the son of God by doing the miraculous, by calming the sea and walking on water and bringing forth harvest from both sea and land. And he'll earn the authority to be the king of kings, but it won't come through his power, it will come through his weakness. The devil knew what Jesus wanted, but the devil offered Jesus a shortcut to what he wanted with no pain. Jesus, you can get everything you're going to do over the next three years in one day if you would just bow down to me. You're going to do everything that you want, and it won't even hurt. You won't have to be rejected by your hometown. You won't have to run for your life at times. You won't be attacked. There won't be no crown of thorns. There won't be a cup of suffering to drink. There won't be any Calvary. You can do all of it, Jesus, if you just turn toward me. And therein lies the truth of all temptation. By turning toward the devil, we can't help but turn away from God. And we meet in this story Jesus who just like us is tempted. Every one of us has been tempted. Jesus is tempted in every single way except for this one important difference. Our kids sang about it last week. Tempted in every way except he was without sin. Jesus never turned. So with that let me teach you Jesus' strategy to defeat the devil. I'm going to move a little bit quicker here toward the end. Jesus offers, shows us three things that show up in the scripture. First, Jesus sees the big picture. He knows what's at stake, and he doesn't fall for the bait. Jesus doesn't give in because he knows what the mission is all about. The second thing that Jesus does is over and over again, Jesus quotes scripture to push back against the devil. Facing temptation, Jesus quotes Deuteronomy three different times. Use God's word as your guide. When you are tempted... What should I do? Don't rush to a decision. Instead, rush to the scriptures. Rush to open it up and look comprehensively. Now, what's really interesting in the second temptation is that the devil comes to Jesus and says, jump off this building, the temple, because the scriptures say, the devil uses the scriptures against Jesus, the scriptures say, if you jump, the angels will catch you. And Jesus, the good theologian, says, you're not reading scripture correctly. You're not supposed to put the Lord your God to the test. Guess what? The devil knows the Bible better than you do. And so it would be good, it would be in your best interest to know the scriptures and know what they really say and know them comprehensively. It would be good for you to become a theologian, and I'm going to try my hardest every Sunday to help you get there. The third point is really important. At the end, Jesus finally says, away from me. Get away from me. And some of you continue to put yourselves in circumstances where the devil's right next to you. And you don't say, get away from you. You say, show me more. I'm listening. I'm paying attention. If you want to resist the devil, if you want the evil to flee from you, you might want to tell him to leave. I think one of the underused resources that we have as Christians is to confront the devil. There is no story in the entire scripture where God comes against the devil and the devil wins. Not one. You have the power that when you feel tempted to say, Satan, leave me alone, and he will leave. You might have to say it over and over and over again, he will leave. You have God's power to push back against the forces of evil. Okay, here's a couple of takeaways for us, and then we're going to get to the home stretch here. First, it's important for you to realize that you aren't evil because you are tempted, okay? So don't be surprised by temptation. 
Jesus himself is tempted. Therefore, you're not wrong if you're feeling a temptation. Second, count the costs. Don't rush to action. Don't rush into sin. Third, you can resist the devil. James 4 says, submit yourselves to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. If you want the devil to leave you alone, it would be a good thing to resist him. But if you let him in, he's going to continue to take more. Fourth, don't fight alone. You have tools to use. Scripture, prayer, and the community of faith called the church. Use those things. Last two insights. This one's really good. The last verse that we read today was verse 11. 4 verse 11. This is what it says. The devil left him, Jesus. The devil left Jesus, and the angels came and attended him. The first two temptations of Jesus in the desert, the first one was for food. He's starving to death. The second one was that the angels would save him by catching him if he jumped off the temple. In this verse, the father brings to Jesus the salvation he's been waiting for, but he had to wait for it. He gets food. He gets the angels to care for him. I actually think this is a little picture of what some of you will encounter when you die is that you've been spending, some of you, years and decades waiting for answers to your prayer. That you find yourself in a wilderness that feels like 40 days and 40 nights without what you need. And you've been praying again and again for physical relief, emotional relief, reconciliation in a relationship, that you want something that's broken in the world around you to be changed. And you keep praying and praying and praying and trusting in God. And it won't happen. Your prayer will not be answered until you die. But then the Lord will send the angels to you, and they will attend to you. In life, your, God's answer to your prayer is sometimes yes, sometimes no, and most often not yet. Many of us live in the not yet. We're praying to God for deliverance. And the last thought, and this takes us toward Holy Week here. I showed you this graph before, this, this chart. Here's the last line on the far right. Jesus, faced with physical needs on the cross, says, I thirst. That Jesus waited for all of his needs to be met so that our greatest need could be met. And when he's in Gethsemane the night before his death, he pleads with the Father, if it's possible, take this cup. Take this cup of suffering. Take the weight of human sin that's on my shoulders. Take it away from me, God. And the Father doesn't take it away. Instead, Jesus is faithful to the very end so that we have what we need. Second, on the cross, the crowd ridicules Jesus and says, if you really are the Son of God, prove it. Come off the cross. And Jesus could have done it, right? He could have come off the cross and impressed maybe a hundred people. But you know what the next generation would have said? It was just a magic trick. It was just an illusion. It was just David Copperfield or whatever your newest magician is. Jesus stayed on the cross and absorbed all of it until the very end. And the last one, the temptation to get the authority of earth. Doesn't that sound a little bit like his meeting with Pilate? Who are you? Are you really the king of the Jews? Is that who you are? And Jesus allowed himself to be rejected, refusing to compromise with any force in this world so that he could always be the king of kings. Here's the truth. The devil's real. Temptation is accurate. And we're faced every day with this battle within ourselves. But God wins. God always wins. And so our hope is to remember his voice and to shut out all the other voices. As you enter this season of Lent, would you be strengthened by God's love? And even if you find yourself alone, would you trust in his goodness no matter what? In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen.